incredible history uh, irfan uh, habib and so many others you know these are not the only persons and uh, particularly in other in india other part of the country and uh, you know i mean the archaeological sources have been scanned very extensively and very critically and a lot of interesting things began to be said about uh, i mean uh, uh, the historical uh, past uh, the medieval past and uh, and then of course in the deccan also this has happened again uh, i bring in to the picture the uh, uh, persons like uh, uh, professor aloka parashar shain and uh, uh, some others are also involved see like this you know you see now this is how archaeology has uh, become very very important and now i mean uh, uh, i don't want to speak too much about my discipline and uh, i mean how old it is and uh, what it is but then uh, as a kind of uh, i mean uh, 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 sort of introducing uh, uh, myself i would like to say that uh, indian archaeology is more than 150 years old see and of course uh, archaeological sites began to be found right from uh, the closing decades of uh, the uh, 18th century and uh, think of uh, discoveries uh, of uh, sites like uh, amaravati stupa by mckenzie that happened i think uh, if i remember well sometime in uh, 1797 see this and then uh, these discoveries continued straight discoveries uh, there were no regular archaeology as such but then i mean uh, other sites began to be visited uh, by, uh, a kind of antiquarian interest and it was only in uh, 1861 62 the archaeological survey of india was uh, established and then uh, uh, no university had archaeology in its curriculum and uh, only from 1930s uh, slowly archaeology began to be introduced to the uh, academy and probably Calcutta University took the cake and then later on a little later uh, Deccan College Department of Archaeology uh, came up and of course you know I mean uh, from uh, about uh, the 50s uh, thanks to the intervention thanks to the I mean uh, very I mean inspiring plea made by uh, Sir Mortimer Wheeler uh, in a conference of Vice Chancellors uh, archaeology began to be introduced in other universities and etc. That's how we see that become. But then, uh, see, uh, uh, what is important is uh, not to say for archaeology. There is a very, uh, I mean, uh, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> very, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, big topic. We will not go into uh, details. But uh, what is important is uh, there has been some uh, uh, there have been some big changes in the very conception of archaeology. What is archaeology? You see, and uh, uh, to start with, you know, it was treated as uh, sort of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, effort, you know, to look at antiquities and uh, and then, you know, various kinds of, you know, simple objects like, you know, curiosity and uh, I mean, uh, romantic interest and then spirit of adventure and what is called uh, dilettantism and you know see i mean trying to collect some good looking objects or making some sketches and these were the objects uh, which led some of the people uh, to look at monuments and uh, old sites and make sketches and sometimes even uh, small uh, i mean uh, impressionistic uh, you know, uh, reportings and uh, that's how we see archaeology started and that came, uh, this was, this has happened in the West, and this has happened even in the, uh, even in our own country. And uh, see, much of, uh, you know, the efforts uh, dealing with the uh, discoveries of uh, archaeological sites uh, in India, in uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, 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 first, second, third quarters of uh, the 19th century were along these lines, you know, see. And then, of course, uh, Cunningham, uh, uh, made this memorandum and uh, Lord Canning said, okay, you know, you can have a regular department. So a sort of uh, knowledge acquiring uh, urge came into the picture. See, with the establishment of the archaeological uh, department, I don't know whether it was called archaeological survey, but archaeological department in 1861, oh, you know, see that uh, these ancient sites are there 
and probably they can give us some information, some knowledge about the past. See, uh, uh, I mean, the, the uh, earlier uh, sort of uh, uh, human urges of curiosity, romantic spirit, spirit of adventure, slowly gave way to this knowledge acquiring urge. See, and oh, that these ancient sites could inform us about the past, could tell us something meaningful about the past. You see. So, and uh, that's how we see, I mean, uh, more and more sites were busy. Cunningham's, uh, I mean, uh, two decade long, uh, you know, field visits to sites, you know, I mean, covering the, practically uh, the entire, <clears throat> I mean, uh, 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 upper India, you see, right from, you know, Bengal Delta to Punjab and you know, I mean, it's just amazing every year, you know, for two to three months he was out in the field recording these various sites and uh, uh, I mean, uh, he used uh, uh, as clues for his surveys, you know, the the accounts left behind by the Chinese travelers, you know, Fitzong and Pahian and that's how I think, uh, I mean, uh, he brought Arkansas alive and uh, and he left behind, you know, I mean, very voluminous reports, some 20 reports, you know, and giving excellent descriptions, including sketches. Photography was not used that commonly. Uh, sketches of various structures, monuments, and, you know, beautiful issues. And really, I mean, he laid the foundations of Indian archaeology. And, and we began to realize that, oh, not only we have ancient sites, but they could do, give us some information about ancient geography, ancient, you know, I mean, uh, 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 places of pilgrimage and uh, uh, political history and, and various aspects of our past, you see. So this knowledge acquiring the urge, you know, came into prominence in a clear way, you see. And uh, this continued uh, into uh, the next century, that is uh, the last century, 20th century. and. Uh, more and more sites and uh, <clears throat> uh, various regional branches of the survey were opened in the south, in the west, and uh, uh, in the east, and uh, more and more offices, and uh, regularly, I mean, you see. Uh, so it became, uh, this knowledge acquiring interest uh, became uh, all pervasive. But what was this kind of knowledge? See, see knowledge could be of various kinds. Knowledge could be very simple, you see. I mean, uh, uh, answering queries of what, when, and where, but knowledge also could uh, be, I mean, of the type which, you know, seeks answers to uh, questions of why and how, you see. And so, what was essentially sort of descriptive knowledge, what was essentially, I mean, uh, factual accounts of sites and, uh, you know, I mean, measurements of the monuments, measurements of the sites, you know, uh, classification of the sites into I mean, uh, uh, different uh, kinds, you know, slowly, you know, began to give way to knowledge which was directed at reconstructing the culture sequence. See, not just one period, but oh, it is that too. But these various sites belong not to one period, but they belong to various periods. That there is, there is, uh, there is a chronological, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> ordering of uh, sites, see. So this is what is called culture sequence approach, or it is also sometimes called culture history approach. What was uh, a sort of a very descriptive, classificative knowledge turned into knowledge, which I mean gave us uh, oh, see that this area witnessed culture sequence from this period to this period. Let us say, I mean. Uh, the Mauryan period, if you are talking of historical uh, phase, you know, the Mauryan period, then, you know, we see a bit, uh, then we see a bit of uh, the other periods, the Kushana period, and then we see uh, comes the Gupta period, etc., etc. You see, this is what is called culture sequence approach or culture history approach. And that uh, uh, culture history approach means something little more also, that not merely reconstructing the, the various uh, Phases or periods of the past, but then also trying to, uh, you know, uh, procure some information, some meaningful information about various aspects of these various cultural periods. See, something about uh, 
political issues, something about, uh, I mean, uh, uh, cultural patterns, something about uh, economy and you know, see. So this is, uh, this is, uh, I think, something uh, which became very, very, I mean, prominent uh, till uh, about the 1960s, say, uh, from something like 1930s uh, to 1960s, uh, this became uh, a very, uh, common theme in Indian archaeology, whether it is prehistory, whether it is proto-history, whether it is historical archaeology, and very commonly, and you know, and we began to realize that, of course, there are some common threads, but then each region in India, see, India is a diverse country, and you can't just have that uniformity, but then, you see, uh, establishment of regional culture sequences and you know so the, i think a great leap in our understanding of this astonishing adventure of man as panditji uh, uh, put it uh, uh, you know in his own uh, way and uh, oh yes you see did you know i mean uh, one began to feel proud about one's area one's you know rich heritage and cross-cutting you know, centuries and even millennia and so it went on you see, you see. and then came uh, somewhere in 1970s uh, uh, particularly I mean uh, the Deccan College probably other places too uh, this is nothing uh, I mean very innovative from our side but uh, as a kind of uh, I mean uh, reflex action uh, I mean uh, reflecting uh, the trends in, uh, I mean, uh, contemporary global archaeology uh, in uh, the U.S., you know, uh, particularly to some extent even in England, Cambridge University. In the 60s, you know, there came up uh, what we uh, call uh, new archaeology, see. And uh, uh, this new archaeology, I mean, uh, there are many figures, uh, unfortunately. Uh, two of the major proponents, they are dead and gone, you see, uh, Professor uh, Lewis Bilford from uh, the US and uh, David Clark from Cambridge University. And uh, see, they started telling, yes, you see, this culturalist approach is, uh, is uh, I mean, uh, wonderful and it has given us uh, very good ideas about our past. And uh, uh, But then there is something more, you see, basically, this culturalist approach has given us answers to, you know, queries of what, when, and where. But then, you know, human culture, human society is not merely consisting, you know, uh, economic aspects, social aspects, religious aspects, and political aspects, etc. But then, you know, these are all interlinked. And, uh, I mean, there are some interactions, you know, taking place between these various components. And then, of course, you know, all these interactions, again, are interlinked with the, with the environment to, around the societies and these environments again are quite different from area to area. Each society lives in its own environment. Think of Indian geography, just you know, I mean, homogeneous, you see, there are so many, I mean, geographical differences, full of diversity. Naturally, people living in the coastal area adapt themselves to the coastal environment. People living in the Gangetic Plains, they adapt themselves to the, you know, I mean, they say, alluvial plains, uh, landscape, people living in the, uh, let's say, some of our, I mean, uh, 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 simple communities living in uh, the, you know, deep forests in the hills, you know, they have their own way of life, you see, it has to suit, you know, that environment. So the argument began to come up that we must look at the past societies in a more dynamic way, not merely in terms of, I mean, uh, you see, when they existed, uh, what exactly you see, I mean, uh, they ate and what they did, but you see, I mean, but in terms of their, you know, I mean, the uh, uh, interactions, the interactions within uh, the culture itself, various components, uh, uh, I mean, interacting one with another, this is what is called culture process approach. And then this culture process in turn being shaped by the environments. So, Cultures, you know, I mean, uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, in archaeology, uh, uh, we used to, in, in the culture uh, sequence, culture history approach, cultures used to be, 
you know uh, defined as you know aggregates of you know some pottery types some stone tool types and you know see but now this is the the culture concept has undergone a major transformation in the sense to be speaking these new ideas were imbibed from the side of anthropology and sociology and particularly in the united states you know i mean uh, uh, archaeology is part of anthropology department so it is uh, i mean uh, if, uh, one can easily imagine uh, some of the archaeologists you know sort of i mean uh, listening to the ideas of their you know colleagues in the department whether as students or as a faculty and then you see and uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, read definition of uh, culture like culture is not just to uh, a summary of various kinds of things that culture is an adaptive mechanism you see as one of the anthropologists put it culture is extra somatic means of adaptation culture is I an mean, extra somatic that is see most of the animal organisms use their bodily limbs to do their daily activities to acquire resources and to, uh, to dig holes to uh, medicine or whatever you see but then uh, uh, man for good or bad i don't know you see i mean <laughs> it's uh, debatable man has uh, you know the ability to create uh, artificial things see and then uh, use them uh, for fulfilling his uh, needs what are these artificial things they can be simple stone tools these could be automatic weapons these could be satellites or not God knows what more we have in the offing, you know. You see, so this uh, this concept became uh, very common in the 1960s uh, in America and to some extent in England. And then 1970s, you know, some or other this percolated, uh, you know, <laughs> to the Indian soil, and particularly Deccan College, my own teacher, uh, Professor Sankalia, uh, took the lead. Till then, uh, he was uh, very much a part of uh, the old culturist tradition, but then he read some of the writings and he started thinking, yes, there is some, there is some truth in these new ideas. I think we should start uh, talking about and uh, also using some of these ideas in our dealings with uh, prehistoric past, proto-historic past, and if possible, even uh, the historical period. That's how I think uh, uh, I mean, uh, from 1970s, Indian archaeology began to change its uh, color, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, from 1980s, uh, uh, some other developments took place in the West. Uh, what is called uh, irrigational archaeology? Uh, this is what is called post-processual archaeology. That yes, indeed, uh, I mean, culture is uh, a matter of process. And the interactions are very much there between various components, between these and uh, natural uh, 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 parts of the environment around the societies. But then ultimately, we must, you know, I mean, culture is not meant only for fulfilling uh, daily needs. It's not merely utilitarian, it's not merely functional in its connotations. And ultimately, we should be able to able to get back to, to the to the minds human minds which actually where actually ideas are conceived and it is these ideas which ultimately create to tangible things see uh, ideas are intangible right? so this is uh, this is another trend again borrowing from the neighboring uh, disciplines you know like uh, human geography anthropology so this is uh, what is called radiational archaeology and uh, uh, some of the workers in India again she brought this and so there is a, a kind of a debate in the world archaeology uh, including Indian archaeology and uh, which of these uh, which of these uh, perspectives uh, dealing with archaeology uh, is appropriate or appropriate whether the earlier you know I mean you see are just the very the fundamental uh, human just which he started to uh, i mean uh, taking interest in uh, the you know antiquary demons around us whether the pyramids or china wall or stupas or you know, like uh, curiosity or you know uh, 
this uh, culturally kind of approach or you know, this uh, processual kind of approach or this ideological approach see, there is always a debate and uh, and people are you know see i mean oh you know see, see that particular perspective is uh, more relevant other perspectives are wrong and this debate goes on both in the west and uh, for good or bad also in the east i think in a way i mean the uh, similar things uh, probably happen e even in history you see uh, i'm not fully aware of uh, the scenario in history but but probably you see is there in most of the social sciences and humanities and uh, but i sometimes uh, i mean the <laughs> look at it uh, uh, you know see what is important is uh, in uh, academic disciplines uh, uh is very necessary that we have a perspective no doubt about this but then see looking at the world around us whether it is the human world or the natural world nature itself i mean uh, there is just one perspective which is valid for all ages to talk but there is one person uh, you know i mean who will give the final answer and this is the final answer to understand the, the world around us and to me sort of i mean uh, such a proposition uh, looks very preposterous and uh, why preposterous for the simple reason uh, that the the world in which we are living you know, what is it i mean the whole universe itself i mean it has a long history and uh, days are gone when uh, we used to believe god created this universe you know i mean uh, uh, in uh, on fine morning we let us say uh, you know uh, christian theology said you know in the uh, 4004 bc somewhere there about and uh, i don't think uh, i mean any one of us seriously uh, harbor those ideas any longer and uh, if we harbor those that you see universe the world was created at one point in time but then we, that creative agency can if sort of if that agency is dissatisfied you can say in one moment oh, okay let the world go out of existence i think that that cannot is there anyway probably most of us do not believe in that on the other hand we i mean allow for you know i mean ages and ages the long history and then see world will go on and which means that i mean there will be newer aspects of the reality around us and if that is so whatever ideas we have today whether it is about i mean archaeological sites or about you know i mean the, the subject matter of history or you know, for that matter about bonding or you know i mean or about the see i mean the universe i think they are only i mean they are good for the for today see and better russell put it very beautifully when he said you see all our ideas about the whole whole you see phenomenon you see is they are all just uncertainly certain see they are certain for today but you know uncertain whether they will be they will hold good tomorrow you see i think this is so if that if we believe in that general proposition i think all our ideas about this particular perspective in our theology or history i think everyone every perspective has its own uh, strong points every perspective has its own uh, uh, probably negative points i think uh, we should uh, we should all be just like uh, i mean religious space each i mean religious space has its own i mean uh, good points and uh, probably see i mean uh, not so good uh, some uh, see I mean, points which are not uh, really worth considering I, i think you know we should uh, believe that and see i would like to believe that all these perspectives are valid in their own way it all depends on which particular aspect of the reality which you are you are presently seized with what is the particular research problem which period you are talking about and which aspect of which period you are talking about whether it is neolithic culture whether it is gupta period or particular aspect of the gupta period i think uh, then you see probably you can make a choice oh you see i think that particular perspective is more relevant for understanding this But there is nothing like uh, uh, there is there can't be uh, i mean anything like a cookbook approach to uh, understanding aspects of uh, historical past or i mean uh, any aspect of uh, you know 
uh, any component of the archaeological record. I think this is what, you know, you see. So, uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, those of us who do not have any sort of doctrinaire uh, approach to the study of the past, you see, I mean, you are familiar with these, you know, I mean, corals. So, uh, in fact, uh, Ashish Nandi has called uh, historians, you know, a garrulous lot. You call some, you know, <laughs> uh, groups, you know, you see. And uh, if one is not, uh, uh, see, a watery to any particular approach, uh, there are, you know, see, very popular, we say, uh, somebody is uh, a leftist historian, somebody is a rightist. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, uh, if one is not uh, uh, a strong watery of any particular approach, then uh, I think uh, doing the uh, study of the past uh, is really enjoyable. And uh, you like to experiment with uh, lots of ideas and uh, lots of uh, perspectives and then you see the perspectives change from topic to topic you see if you are taking religious history maybe uh, one perspective is more useful than other one but if you are uh, taking the economic aspect of uh, a particular period probably some other perspective is more. i think uh, this uh, spirit of resilience uh, we should uh, have you see uh, this is i think uh, what i have come to Realize, but I, I don't know. See, I mean, uh, whether uh, such uh, resilient attitude uh, <laughs> appeals to I mean, uh, my you know, you see, uh, friends uh, in history or archaeology. Anyway, that is what. See, now this is how I mean, uh, uh, archaeology has developed, and uh, I would now li like to I mean, uh, uh, spend a bit of time about uh, the Deccan region itself. See, and uh, I mean, what exactly see, I mean, has happened here? And uh, generally, you know, I mean, common uh, sort of parlance, and we treat India as okay, you know, uh, Northern India and Southern India. And then these uh, distinctions, you know, have been coming uh, right from uh, very early times. And uh, Uttarapada and Dakshinapada and uh, the whole track to north of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Narmada and Vindyas, okay, you know, you see, Uttarabhada and then, and then the, the rest of it, uh, sort of, you know, peninsular part of India, see, Dakshinapada and, uh, in a way, probably it is, okay, but, but I think uh, what is important is, you see, I say this not because uh, I am part of the Deccan region, but I think uh, uh, it is very important to realize uh, that, uh, you see, I mean, uh, this distinction, uh, this division, of uh, the Indian subcontinent into two major zones uh, is okay in a general way, but but I think uh, you see it is if you look at uh, uh, the various geographical features, uh, whether they are hills or rivers or you know I mean uh, landscape features, uh, probably see one will realize uh, there is uh, real scope for carving uh, a, a third region and uh, and that is uh, the Deccan region. I think uh, 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 to me it looks uh, very sensible from many points of view. What is the Deccan region? See, and uh, starting from uh, the Narmada downwards uh, and uh, up to the Krishna Valley, you see, and Krishna and its various tributaries. And then comes uh, the deep south. If you look at, uh, you know, the, the I mean, geographical features, if you look at uh, the linguistic uh, features, if you look at uh, even the cultural aspects of it, and if you look at uh, the, I mean, uh, historical record, if you look at uh, the archaeological record, uh, I think uh, this region, uh, I mean, uh, uh, has, uh, you know, an individuality of its own. And this was pointed out to uh, long ago when James Rennell wrote his uh, first book uh, uh, about Indian geography, somewhere uh, toward the end of uh, the 18th century, I forget the title of the book, Beautiful, the first, uh, I mean, account of Indian geography. He was already, you know, you see, and uh, I don't know whether he has used the word Deccan, but you see, uh, you see, uh, uh, but this region, see, I mean, see, it has its own features, and uh, these two major streams, you see Narmada flowing uh, uh, towards the west and then you see Krishna flowing, uh, you see, towards the east 
and then you see this you know, beautiful plateau track you see and and as it were you know this plateau track is held by two arms one is you see the you know the uh, west coast uh, the comfort coast uh, and further down you see i mean uh, and then other one uh, you see i mean uh, the east coast and uh, the sayadris western guards and the western side and uh, the eastern guards on the side and see, so this is uh, i mean distinct to uh, the sort of uh, geographical entity plateau track and then occupied basically by the deccan tribes see and areas further south to occupied by you know the arcane formations you know the granites and ices some parts of the deccan are also covered by the arcane ones. but basically the major formation is the deccan trap the the black rock you see and uh, 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 i mean uh, uh, hyderabad doesn't have hyderabad basically has but then if you come to i mean gulbarga bidar already you begin to see you know this black rock marathwada of course full of it you see and you know like this you see and then you know i mean the linguistic peculiarity you see this is basically area i mean covered by the dravidian languages including the tribal i mean languages like gond language which is part of the dravidian but then there is one difference you see is i mean in maharashtra we have the major language marathi you know this is this is one language which belongs to the indo aryan group see it is an anomaly is it and uh, it's very likely that the substratum uh, uh, even in the northern deccan maharashtra region present day maharashtra region was also kind of see i mean the, some dravidian stratum but there is some controversy about it we will not go in and then culturally there is some you see there are some similarities you know general similarities and in uh, social structure kinship organization as rauti karve the famous anthropologist pointed out to there are some general battles and uh, and, uh, 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 and of course uh, here you know history also becomes very important and uh, particularly during uh, the medieval period uh, i think this region achieved uh, identity in a in a more certain way and uh, i mean all these you know uh, medieval dynasties whether it is vijayanagara or the various sultanates and who won who lost that is not a major point but then i see you see uh, you know i mean the, uh, these medieval you see kingdoms they they imported to, to this region the political identity and uh, the word deccan or you know see uh, probably gurugul is called uh, deccan and of course uh, anglicized form you know, i mean deccan from dakshina you see now you see it became that is how you see deccan emerged as uh, very very important you see and uh, what is important to, uh, from my point of view from archaeological point of view is that can again uh, has uh, an identity of its own uh, from a uh, regular archaeological point of view for the simple reason uh, not only investigations uh, of uh, archaeological sites in this area started uh, very very early uh, i told you i mean uh, how mckenzie uh, discovered this amravati site as early as uh, 1797 in fact uh, this is the first major uh, archaeological mound to be discovered you see sites like you know monuments like the mahabalipuram pradas and you see these were known but regular archaeological site mound bearing archaeological site this is the first one in fact uh, probably the the first archaeological site to be discovered in the whole of south asia and then so many other sites you see and uh, uh, here we have to really pay i mean uh, respects uh, and compliments to colonel uh, uh, colonel mckenzie uh, i'm sure you are familiar with, uh, with some of his uh, contributions and uh, who came to the madras uh, presidency as a soldier then he see joined the engineering department <coughs> then he became a uh, a great cartographer he retired as the surveyor general of india in 1821 see and he was also i mean uh, uh, i mean uh, played a role in uh, the third uh, you know this uh, mysore war you know you see which led to the downfall of tipu sultan you see anyway that is it so this mckenzie while doing his uh, i mean uh, uh, 
you know, photographic surveys. And he covered practically, I mean, whole of present day Andhra Pradesh, even Telangana, and large parts of Karnataka. And, you know, I mean, for the first time, maps were being prepared of these areas. See, and the company rule very much wanted to know what exactly these areas are, what are the resources that could be there. That's how we see photography started. And, uh, and uh, Nakanji had great interest in uh, the antiquities and cultural traditions of this region. And in fact, he wanted to write a book about ancient geography and history and culture of this area. And then, uh, you know, while uh, doing his cartographic uh, uh, surveys as part of his official uh, uh, duties, he employed uh, the local pundits who would go with him and collect information about various uh, you know, aspects of history, culture, and, you know, you see, I mean, enormous amount of uh, information. You see, famous uh, Mackenzie archives, basically, in uh, the British Library now, but then I think some material in Madras and other places, you see. And, and he was the one who discovered the first series of archaeological sites, Amaravati, and then some Neolithic ash mounds in the Bellary area, and then some megalithic monuments, iron age tombs, you know, you see, and uh, there, of course, in Kalangana, and, uh, and collected lots of manuscripts and uh, even, you know, I mean, he collected information about some of the uh, simple tribal communities like, you know, the Chensus and uh, enormous amount of information, I think. Uh, so he was the one who initiated uh, archaeological uh, investigations in the Deccan region, you see. And then there were others, you know, there was one, you see, this is a famous uh, uh, writer. Uh, you know, Meadows Taylor, who wrote that uh, book, you know, The Confessions of a Thug, you see. And then, you know, he was actually administrator of, uh, I mean, uh, large tracts uh, of present day Telangana, Maratwada, and uh, Hyderabad, Karnataka, you know, you see, and uh, he was a sort of commissioner, you see. I mean, uh, started in, in a very low, small position, but then he rose to the level of uh, uh, commissioner and uh, uh, did excellent administration and uh, but then he also took interest in the antiquarian domains. You know, uh, we are talking about uh, the middle part of uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, 19th century. There was no archaeological survey. But then he found lots of uh, archaeological sites. He wrote some articles and uh, presented the lectures in uh, England, in Ireland, and uh, etc. And then there were others, uh, geologists, you know, Robert Bruce Ford, who found. Uh, uh, who is called the father of Indian tracery, and uh, his uh, first sites uh, uh, are somewhere in the uh, Chennai region. But then he also found a number of sites in the Krishna Valley, you see. like this, you know. And when we come to the, you know, I mean, the end part of the 19th century, uh, lots of workers, you know, surveying, you know, temples, and you know, I mean, uh, so archaeology became there. That is how we see, I mean, archaeology developed uh, in uh, the uh, Deccan region and particularly uh, the southern Deccan region. Southern Deccan region basically covering uh, the Krishna basin. You see, Krishna I means tributaries, you know, is Bhima or uh, Tungabhadra, and you know, you see, and so this, I mean, uh, it's a very long story. I just uh, I can only give you, and because, of, and then uh, after independence, of course, uh, I mean, Deccan College did a lot of work. And Andhra Pradesh Department of uh, Archaeology, and in uh, I mean uh, Hyderabad State contributed in a, in a very big way uh, to the investigation of these uh, various kinds of archaeological sites. Particularly, Gulam Azdani, he was uh, the director of uh, Hyderabad State Department of Archaeology, and uh, we are all familiar with uh, the great contributions uh, which uh, Gulam Azdani made to, to the study of uh, Ajanta. Uh, site of paintings and so many others, you see, I mean, so many other sites, you know, and, uh, and in fact, Fulham has done, he was the person who took interest and to collected, you see, I mean, the, uh, sort of group that brought uh, senior scholars working uh, uh, on the Deccan region together and he, he published those two beautiful volumes, Early History of the Deccan, see, and like this, you know, I mean, uh, 
Deccan College, of course, contributed, and other universities, Karnataka University, and, and uh, of course, Archaeological Survey, and uh, I mean, see, that is how we see, I mean, uh, archaeology developed in uh, the Deccan region, and particularly the southern uh, Deccan region. And, uh, and uh, see, uh, my own, uh, uh, see, I don't want to talk uh, too much about my own work, but then, uh, uh, see, I was inspired uh, as a student uh, of uh, MA course in Archaeology with Deccan College, uh, I had uh, the opportunity of participating in uh, some of the excavations which uh, the department conducted in uh, Bellary district uh, by my guru, Professor Sankalia. And then we were even taken to these sites, Tekalkota and Sanganapalu uh, in the Bellary district. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, those field experiences really inspired me. And uh, of course, uh, those experiences coupled with my uh, village background. I come from a small village in uh, coastal Andhra Pradesh and from a farmer family and then very familiar with the rural way of life and then these Neolithic excavations and you know I mean uh, their house uh, uh, types and then simple pots and pans and etc uh, etc et and, and that you see this is the background uh, against which I selected uh, what is called the Shorapur Dawab, you see, and this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, till a few years ago, this was part of Gulbarga district, but now they have created new districts. Now, this is part of uh, this district of uh, Adgari. You know, if you are familiar with the Wadi station, I think it comes very good. See, this is uh, some three talukas, uh, you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, 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 located. Uh, at the confluence of the Bhima River with the Krishna River, see, and this uh, was the area which was held by the Surapur Bedar Sanstana. This is one of, uh, you know, this Sanstana was one of the feudatories of the Vijayanagara rulers, see, and uh, after the downfall of the Vijayanagara Kingdom, they became sort of independent. Later on, they were part of the Bijapur uh, Ajushahis, then they came under uh, the Hyderabad, you see, I mean, uh, 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 see, uh, area, and uh, sort of they maintained semi independence, you see, and then, of course, it is now part of uh, Karnataka, you see. So, this, uh, you know, this area uh, as part of Nizam's uh, uh, administration, uh, some geologists were sent to, to that area because there are some. Uh, uh, Harvard cyst formations containing gold bearing veins. And uh, there was interest in developing uh, these gold bearing veins into actual mines. So, I mean, geologists were sent by the Hyderabad Geological Department to survey this area and they did wonderful work. And uh, one, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Mahadevan, Dr. Mahadevan, uh, he did excellent uh, geology. And while uh, Doing the geology, he found uh, archaeological sites. Very interesting. You see, this is how you know. I mean, uh, many of the archaeological discoveries, uh, uh, discoveries were made by the geologists. Uh, Robert Bruce Ford, uh, you know, I mean, uh, he worked much before him, and then see, Malay and so many others, and uh, they gave short uh, accounts of their archaeological discoveries at the end of uh, their geological reports. So with these clues, I selected uh, this Shahapur dog, see, three Talukas, Javarki, Shahapur and Shahapur Talukas, see, and uh, just about uh, I chose this thing, and uh, uh, started some, somewhere in uh, 1965, uh, and then, you know, I mean, uh, started uh, the clues given by Mahadev. Mahadev later on became a professor of geology in uh, Andhra University, uh, see, in fact, uh, uh, you know, when I was doing my B. Honours in history uh, in Andhra University, he was professor of geology. I now realized that one day I will <laughs> select <laughs> Shorapur Dhawab for my doctoral research, you know, where he did his, uh, I mean, the geological survey. It was very, you know, see. Anyway, I have actually dedicated one of my books dealing with Shorapur Dhawab's archaeology. To uh, Professor Mahadevan, you see. Anyway, you see. So this uh, went on, you know, for uh, nearly 35 years. You see, I and my students, you know, 
surveyed uh, this area very closely and uh, and the entire you know i mean cultural history of sharapur right from the paleolithic to the i mean the medieval period one of my students uh, dr s k arudi he is uh, in charge of this uh, southern center of ic chair in bangalore he has uh, done a thesis on the sarpo sansthan and uh, the fortification there and then other students did done uh, you know the uh, historical archaeology temples and inscriptions and uh, and then of course my own work has been in uh, uh, prehistoric proto history and uh, <coughs> my detailed the surveys uh, surveys in this area several hundred uh, archaeological uh, sites belong to the prehistoric and protohistoric period and uh, what is important see i mean uh, particularly one part of this shorapur gob see it is actually a basin surrounded by hills and very good uh, i mean soil cover and perennial water supply even slightly away from krishna but then there are springs you know you see and perennial water and that is how this you know this is called uh, the hunski by called uh, basin small area of some 1000 square kilometer given excellent record of uh, the entire uh, stone age record with the lower paleolithic uh, what we call you see uh, the very beginning part of the old stone age and then the succeeding stage is the middle paleolithic evolved see i mean the stone tool technology the upper paleolithic and then the mesolithic see these are the uh, three or four major uh, stages in the uh, the development of uh, in the uh, hunting gathering societies you see and then when we come to about 3000 bc uh, we have the beginning of the early farming we have like settled village agro pastoral work right okay. see and uh, excellent evidence and we have conducted what the excavations of the hard protocol what good evidence and then uh, the arrays period when you uh, see large tools were being uh, constructed and then of course the historic period see so now this you know i mean i can give you details uh, i mean here but then see preserved excellent uh, record see and uh, uh, this whole of uh, southern deccan for of the hope is one region but likewise better district has the raichur district has the uh, and thanks to the work of of famous scape is uncle this uh, raymond elchin and uh, his wife bridget elchin likewise you know see that bellar uh, area the late professor b subrao and to workers and this extremely rich and then of course uh, present day telangana also has given uh, but see uh, particularly the prehistoric proto history started a bit late uh, actually telangon has a tremendous uh, scope and uh, the former uh, ap director of archaeology sasri he passed away uh, and it was a combined state to uh, i mean uh, we said we see not near the andhra area but telangana area also in a lot of sites and he started a lot of excavation in uh, telangana area huli katta and i mean uh, Uh, he's published uh, thesis uh, he is a good account of this see and uh, telangana is a tremendous french uh, entities for uh, prehistoric and uh, proto historic researches and uh, two three students of that college uh, have been, uh, completed their dissertations in godavari valley and with uh, stupidities and a uh, lot of uh, lot of scope anyway see this is i think you know i mean very briefly uh, see the the uh, 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 I mean, uh, archaeologically part of uh, the Deccan. Uh, we are not going to the uh, case, but then uh, what is important is uh, the photographs are there. Uh, can get some details, but then there is actually tremendous uh, further scope. And uh, I forgot to tell you. Uh, I mean, uh, we have very early dates. I mean, uh, the site of Isampur, that is the lower Paleolithic uh, site. Uh, and this is one among some 200 uh, uh, lower Paleolithic localities in this Hunski uh, Bajpal Basin of Sharapur. This has given uh, a date of 1.2 million years. So this is 12 lakh years ago. Unfortunately, we have only one date at the moment. But this the, this date suggests that uh, I mean the Deccan area probably has very very early sites. You know. See, going beyond the 
in one million years. And then Maharashtra has a few sites, and uh, I'm not surprised if uh, Telangana, when it is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, open for detailed studies, it may also give, uh, I mean, very early sites, you see. But uh, there is uh, tremendous scope for uh, this kind of uh, work. And uh, uh, see, uh, there are uh, there is tremendous scope not only for see prehistory proto history but even uh, for I mean historical archaeology. And uh, you will uh, recall uh, that this southern part of Deccan, basically the Krishna Valley, and you know think of these uh, I mean uh, areas like Kannur district, uh, Bellary district, and even uh, this Adgiri district, you know. You know, uh, this area has uh, the largest uh, cluster of uh, Ashokan uh, edicts going to the Mauryan period. We are familiar with uh, sites like uh, Sanati, which is not very far from uh, Wadi Junction, uh, some uh, 30 40 kilometers from uh, Wadi Junction. And then, you know, um, sites like, you know, you see, I mean, uh, Brahmagiri and uh, Chandravadi and uh, Maski. Uh, this masky uh, uh, small edict of Ashoka uh, and a big uh, rock border uh, in a sort of rock country like this. And this is one uh, one of the few edicts of Ashoka where his name is mentioned in the uh, Raichu district. So, uh, uh, masky is a Taluka place in the Raichu district, you know, uh, not very far from Tungavadra uh, River. And then Kannur you know, see, has uh, Ashokan edicts. There is a large cluster, I think, uh, something like 10, 12 uh, Ashokan edicts are there. Now, till today, see, they're there, they're, they're all deciphered. And, but what is, uh, uh, what is important, uh, uh, what is uh, sort of uh, I mean, intriguing is that uh, what is the explanation for uh, you know, this clustering of uh, Ashokan edicts? See, when we I said even historical archaeology, there is a tremendous scope uh, a topic like this, you know. So far, see, we are not been able to explain why not just one or two. Shokan edicts are there scattered uh, all over the Indian subcontinent, right up to, you know, I mean, you see, uh, Afghanistan. But here there is a clustering. You know? Why Why there should be a clustering? What is the reason? They are not just uh, randomly, I mean, uh, put there. See, there is some. There is some reason behind it. What was, you see, I, I think it is here, the, you see, I mean, historians, geographers, archaeologists, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, probably, I mean, <laughs> other uh, social scientists also uh, need to come together and uh, evolve uh, a common uh, research strategy. Why, you see, you see probably, I mean, uh, uh, see, some explanations they have been put forward, but uh, I am not fully satisfied with uh, any one of those explanations. But see, one thing is very clear. See, if you look at this area, southern Deccan, see there are agricultural communities. There are some, you see, I mean, uh, urbanized areas. But there are also, I mean, the tribal, you see, pockets, hill dwelling, you know, tribal communities are there, and uh, communities living at uh, different. Uh, Levels of you know uh, existence, subsistence, you know, you see, and and when we you know, I mean, there, there is a lot of diversity, you see, and and just project this picture backwards to, to something like 2,300 years ago. One can imagine, you see, probably there were some you see communities who were uh, you know practicing you know uh, these. Uh, uh, I mean, burying the dead in the large tombs, what we call Mechalis, you see, late Iron Age. And then there were some, you see, tribal communities taking out, you know, their livelihood by way of hunting gathering. There were some communities who were already somewhat civilized, civilized maybe some semi urban setting. And there were some agricultural uh, communities who were settled in the villages and, uh, I mean, uh, who were. Uh, you know, I mean, doing the uh, agro pastoral activities and uh, lots of lot of diversity and uh, could be, you know, some kind of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, you can't call this a warlike situation, but some, you know, kind of uh, conflicts, you know, between these various groups, various speak, maybe different languages, 
uh, at least different speech forms and to ethnically a bit different and then you know different lifestyles and you know see maybe uh, maybe this is the reason why you know Ashoka in uh, I think uh, one of these edicts uh, is uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, requesting them, you know, I mean, uh, uh, sort of prodding them to be very careful while dealing uh, uh, with the other groups. And then, you see, that famous statement which he made, oh, you know, that, uh, that uh, you see, I mean, uh, respect to uh, other man's uh, way of life, faith, you know, just as you would like your own way of life, your own faith to be respected. You know, I mean, I, I think that message is uh, see, everlasting. The significance of that message is everlasting. It is valid even till today. But why he made that statement? What was you see? And uh, you see, like this, you know, probably some people uh, like this you can start with and then go back to this and then you know sort of see this is one problem. You see, uh, like this historical archaeology has other problems too. You see and. Uh, 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 so it is not that, uh, uh, and as I said earlier, Telangana offers a tremendous scope for prehistory, protohistory, and historical archaeology. And in fact, uh, in the Deccan region, this is one region uh, which has been very insufficiently investigated. See? There is tremendous uh, scope here. And uh, I mean, even from uh, the ethnographic point of view, see, I mean, uh, we have all these, you know, I mean, uh, simple communities, whether it is just or you know, wounds or, you know, you see, they, and so, uh, uh, Telangana uh, archaeology could supply vital clues for some of the, you know, the problematic issues in the, the archaeology of Deccan, whether it is prehistory, proto-history or historical period. I think uh, this is what I would like to say, and I don't think uh, I should say, I mean, uh, much more about my own work is not uh, is not a lecture about my own. See, I think this is it. and finally I mean uh, see I would like to uh, you know I mean uh, just uh, a little bit about this topic you see okay this is study of the past whether I mean we are using the, the regular the historical sources and calling it history or whether we are really using the, Tangible, I mean, archaeological sources call it archaeology. These all, you see, these, I mean, these all, you see, one composite study, studying the past of a particular region, you see, I mean, whether it is Deccan or uh, India for that matter, you see. Uh, and to, finally, I mean, uh, you see, things come up, you know, queries come up very often, you know, you see, we confront these queries when we are traveling in bus or train or or whatever and what is what is the use of it all you see i mean what is its relevance and i think this is one topic you know I mean, which has been there you know right from the beginning of you see and the answers could be many and varied but then i think uh, see i mean here again now uh, i would uh, think that to uh, see and then what pandit uh, nehru said uh, in uh, those introductory pages uh, 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 the discovery of India, I find uh, there is a lot of sense, a lot of uh, one could, uh, I mean, uh, derive some inspiration from the way, you see, and uh, uh, I feel that, uh, that you know, I mean, uh, his, uh, uh, his observations, uh, you know, give some clues that indeed uh, in a country like India, where, uh, you see, I mean, uh, uh, you see, much of the present is uh, nothing but a derivation from the past uh, study of history, archaeology. I think uh, they are not merely academic pursuits, but actually, see, they, they can uh, help us, uh, you know, to brighten our minds in a very big way. And uh, some of these, uh, you see, I mean, it says, you know, uh, uh, in those pages that he has come to the study of India's past, uh, not in terms of interest in acquiring, you know, information about uh, various events or various kings or various dates, not at all, you see. And, uh, I mean, you see, he came to it because uh, 
realized that he, he can't understand the present of India unless you know he I mean uh, uh, he's able to go back to the past because I mean as I mentioned earlier. As I mentioned earlier, see, he, I mean, look at, it, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the past, uh, not a just uh, uh, one uh, island like situation, but he looked at it, uh, you see, as uh, something connected with uh, uh, the present and uh, the future. See, he says that, uh, I mean, uh, the present is uh, a sequel to the past and it is, uh, a, I mean, uh, 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 See, it has, uh, I mean, uh, proceeded from the past and it gives uh, a path for the future. See? So these are all interlinked and uh, if that is accepted, then uh, then there is some meaning. And particularly, I'm considering that India is a diverse, uh, you know, zone uh, on the globe, diverse geographically, geomorphologically, linguistically, Uh, linguistically and you know culturally, socially, what not that from every point of view. And how come this diversity I mean, has someone from above God, you know, on one particular day, I mean, uh, uh, impose this diversity on us? No, oh, I think this is diversity coming from ages. You see, it is, it is an extricate of the past. And and unless we have clear understanding of the past, we can't grapple with this diversity and understand its meaning. See? And otherwise, you know, I mean, we make the mistake of deriving wrong meanings about this diversity. And I think this particular statement can be elaborated into a full lecture. See, so it is it is particularly I think this observation which. And the Nehru was trying to, uh, I mean, put forward uh, in those introductory pages. I think uh, so. This is, uh, I mean, where uh, this is where, uh, yeah, this is where I think uh, we need to uh, be very cautious uh, uh, about this. And uh, uh, the past can be needs to be interpreted. Meanings can be, but I think. Uh, you see, we have to ensure that, uh, I mean, uh, we interpret it in the way that it is congenial to the betterment of uh, the people around, the society around. And uh, and uh, uh, this is where I think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, history, those of us who are doing history, archaeology, have a great responsibility. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, archaeology history, can just remain uh, as pure uh, academic disciplines. They have uh, a larger societal role to play. I think uh, so. It is with these observations I would like to, I mean, uh, uh, conclude my my this uh, lecture-like presentation. And uh, I would like to thank you once again for for uh, for uh, uh, giving me this chance of interacting with uh, with uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Would you like to take some questions, sir? Yeah, you know, but you see, I am not able to hear you fully. You see, only, you know, there is okay. some... <laughs> okay, you, you are not able to hear me? Yeah, you see, the sound is very, very low, you know. Yeah, you see. Um, okay. Okay, okay, then we'll leave it with that. And uh, maybe, uh, Danish, sir, would you like to say something? Thank uh, Professor K. Padaya. He says, would you like to say something? No, no, what did you say? No, no, I am I am not saying to Professor Kepadaya, but I'm requesting uh, Dr. Danish Moeen, sir. Huh. He okay. wants to say something on that. You are, un you have to unmute yourself, sir. Danish, sir. Over to you, Danish, sir. Unmute yourself, please. 
ഹലോ 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 നോ വി ആർ നോട്ട് ആക്ച്വലി വി ആർ നോട്ട് എബിൾ ടു ഹിയർ തനിഷ് സർസ് വോയിസ് മേബി देयर इज सम टेक्निकल इश्यूज വിത്ത് ഹിം കാൻ യു ഹിയർ മീ തനിഷ് സർ He's requesting someone. Okay, we are not able to hear you. Yeah, he's requesting someone to say something. You know? yeah, okay, okay. Um, maybe, maybe there is some issue with Danish Mohin sir, who is our head of the department. I thought maybe he can say a few words and thank you in the end. Uh, but I'll do the uh, the needful. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for coming and joining us this afternoon. It was uh, it was terrific. uh and uh, as delightful delightful as always i remember that we have had the occasion in the past to host you in our department on few occasions uh i think before the pandemic you came over to the department of history in molana azad national urdu university and we had a wonderful uh, uh interaction with the students and uh, i still remember that you began that conversation by referring to mehru's uh, uh mehru's wonderful depiction of what history is actually so um, but thank you very much for giving us a sense of how discipline of archaeology evolved over time and what are the different uh, theoretical foundations and formal and, and uh, formulations to understand and approach the discipline of archaeology we are very grateful to you sir that you finally uh, took some time out of your busy schedule i know that you are a very busy man but i i am sure that for all the participants here it was a wonderful experience to listen to you uh, not face to face although through online mode but it was a wonderful experience i wish you um, a very happy uh, life and a good health uh, and i hope that we will be able to see you in future many more uh, there will be occasion many more occasions to see you in future in person thank you so much sir thank you so much thank you thank Enjoy. you yeah okay we can close